Okay, so we want the best advice to get the soldiers as they need it. And the issue for us is we want the best way of communicating with locals to be part of that advice. So I'm arguing there's a handheld, it's sitting there in the soldier's hand, everyone has one. There's nothing complicated about it because it's really no more than a cell phone connected to something back there that's a very complicated, knowledge, knowledge-full machine. I've been running around reading Afghanistan stories lately, and I don't have any particularly important ones. I've just taken them out of books. Um, but what I'm trying to get a point is one could do the same thing with shipping as one could do for any area. If you were on a concentrate on Afghanistan, I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading the books written by U.S. soldiers, which is what I was doing. Um, you could, in fact, uh, you know, interview experts, <laughs> because these guys are not experts. This is just a story, the solution, uh, the point of which is that vets are more important than anybody because they fix the animals. And, the locals care a lot about their animals. Uh, this is a, a second story about um, how you could help them with their farms, which are also more important than anything to them. Um, this is a third story about some uh, a kid shot his mother while she was pregnant and unintentionally, and they had a med vacuum out of there, and that when they finished with all those fights and, uh, between the family, whether that was allowed, and he had to operate under her clothing without looking at her because of all the dress codes. And in the end, they saved everyone's life, and that was maybe more important than anything they ever did in the whole time they were in Afghanistan, according to this particular guy. So I'm just arguing that this is about how you get through a herd of sheep. But the, 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 the issue, of course, is there are already, it's easy to find them, thousands of these stories already written. I'm not arguing you want to get written stories. I think what one wants to do is go interview all the, the best people and get video stories. They have to be short and have them indexed properly and have them come up just in time when you're faced with a situation that you are just come from Nebraska and you don't know anything about anything. And how are you going to get any help unless there's an advisor over your shoulder to help you out with whatever you're worrying about? All right. So that's the issue. How is the, how is the device tell the military personnel just in time stories when they need them, at that very moment that they need them? American stories received by Americans have to be reformulated, however, because if they're going to try and tell these stories, they certainly can't tell them the way they heard them, if that's relevant. They may not be telling them. They may be also just they need to know these stories for their own edification to make a decision. But suppose you're trying to the theme of this organization, this thing is negotiating across cultures. Suppose that's what you were trying to do. I was looking around for Afghan folk tales and found one, which I thought was kind of cute, um, which is not particularly related to Afghanistan, but that a, some, a, a champion wrestler knew 365 holds, uh, and he taught only 364 of them to his students, so that when they had to wrestle, he was able to use the other hold. Um, and th you know, th th this is a, 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 the, the king said, never, never give a friend such power over you that if one day he tries to be your enemy, he can defeat you. Okay, so that's a lesson, and part of my argument is here, is if we're going to tell stories to people, remember I said you have to tell things that they already know. You have to map to their stories. You better know what stories they know. I don't know that they know this folktale. I would, I would like anthropologists to be part of this project who could tell us what folktales they know. But my point is, you've got to assume there's some stuff, just like we all know Hansel and Gretel, that they know, right? They can, oh yeah, it's that. And so you can tell the story in those terms. I consulted some experts who uh, I happen to have strong ties, oddly enough, into Pakistan. Um, and so I called my Pakistani friends and said, could we index the Koran and have people just tell Koran stories? And he said, eh, nobody knows the Koran. He said, but what everyone knows is Muhammad's hadiths, which is like wise sayings. And he says, they'll know that. And then I started reading them. And they were, seek knowledge even as far as China. You know, is known to them. It's good for talking about schools. Search for knowledge is an obligation laid on every Muslim. It's good for knowing. Um, I like, the third one I really like, this third one, second one I like, all things a man does for amusement are fake except shooting arrows from a bow, taming a horse, and companionship with one's wife. These are true pleasures. I thought that was about, I actually totally agree with that. Um, so the issue here is that, um, that the way uh, we communicate is through ways they already know. So the issue is not translation of language, that's also true, but <laughs> translation of what we're talking about of into their culture and something they understand. You've got to find a comprehensible way to make your point. And reformulation is this kind of conceptual translation. It's not a linguistic translation. And here I have a, my own very story on that. And one of those is me. You'll have to figure out which one. Uh, Stanford, 1973. And the other one was the chairman of the computer science department at the time. And I decided in 1973 that I had had enough of Stanford and I wanted to leave for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I had arranged a job in Switzerland for myself. Uh, I kind of thought I'd wind up at Yale, but I didn't have the offer yet. And the way Stanford was in those days, now these are hippy-dippy times, you have to understand. The way Stanford was in those days is you had to ask the, the chairman of the department for a leave, but you did it at a party, <laughs> not in an office. So I'm running to the chairman of the party, and he says to me, so how come you're leaving? And I said, I've got to get my head together which is about as far from what I was actually thinking as you possibly could imagine. It was just the way you spoke at Stanford in those days. And, and, and I, you know, I'm thinking, and I, when I said it, after I heard myself say it, I thought, 
Well, I didn't think I was a good bullshitter because I'm well known as being you know, the most honest person on the planet. But there it was, because it wasn't, if I said the reasons, the first thing there were about 50 of them, and second off, none of them would have made him happy. A lot of them were complaints about Stanford. What was the point? So I translated. Now, when I say communication across cultures, you want to understand that that has nothing to do with language and it has nothing to do with Afghans. We're talking communication in a culture there. There was a Stanford culture, the AI lab culture, the whole, uh, there's books written about it, that, 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 that everybody was on the, to, you know, to the left of hippie. And so you, you didn't, you had to talk that way. So negotiation across cultures means story exchange that works for both parties. And it has to be something I understand, he understands, this is what we're doing. How can we judge the effectiveness of any proposed solution? How do we know if the people are going to pop up here in the next, uh, the next hours and the rest of the day. Are they doing something that's working or not? Well, I'm going to argue that the evaluation criteria I've already given you, these are them. That it has to be able to make people better at some of these. Not all of them, some of them. It has to be able to make you better at prediction. It doesn't have to be negotiation. Better at predicting what's going to happen next. Better at diagnosing a situation. Because when you want to negotiate with somebody, you are diagnosing a situation. You are creating a plan. The things you're doing that you're trying to communicate are those things. Software that helps us do something better would first have to help with the big three, diagnosis, planning, and description. And then we have to understand that the good communication starts with having these clear thoughts, having everyone think better. Then in effect, you are trying to get them to think better. The, the very thing I do in my other part of my life, which is teaching people to think better, is exactly what you're doing when you're doing negotiation across cultures. So I'm arguing, will, the, the questions are, will it help military planners plan better? Will it help soldiers make better judgments? Will it help us influence others? Will it help analysts make better diagnosis? Will it help us understanding what the cause of a problem is? Will it help us negotiate better? Will it help those we're talking to understand better? Those are the criteria that I'm talking about. I think that I'm trying to set the tone for the rest of the meeting. That, that those are re the relevant questions to ask about anything you know, pro proposed solutions that anyone gives us. And I'm also arguing very strongly for the creation of a giant national archive of stories, uh, just in time story base that can help people think better and do their jobs better and communicate better. The problem of this, I've been doing it for a lot of years, is collecting the stories. That's the hard part. The rest of it is also hard. Collecting is harder. Getting everybody to sit down. We have, and we've sat down, uh, pointing to Ray, he's not looking at me, but we sat down with, with all the colonels and generals involved in the logistics planning for the first Gulf War, when I, uh, because it resulted as a call from me to DARPA, DARPA program manager at the time, saying, you're going to lose all this information, we ought to get it. And they said, okay, and they gave us a grant, and we interviewed, I don't know how many people, a hundred? some large number. And we created a giant video database. Unfortunately, since it was done in those days, it was put in giant video jukeboxes on, seat, on these enormous disks, where for all I know, it still sits in some army base. But it was never used <laughs> because no one bothered to, to transfer it from ARPA funding to let's get it out into the field kind of funding. But collecting the stories is hard. As it turns out, I've collected stories from every kind of people in the world, and the easiest people in the world to collect stories from turns out to be the military. Why is that? because they're not afraid to tell you when they screwed up. You can, I've started with Anderson Consulting, who never screws up, it turns out. But the military screws up a lot and is very happy to tell you about it. And so we had a really good database. Unfortunately, it's, I don't know where it is. I mean, that's that part of the issue is start to start creating that. Indexing stories is hard, don't misunderstand me. But it's not as hard as collecting the stories. The lessons in the stories and the, uh, what people are trying to do, the very same language that describes what they're doing in their life is the language that describes the indexing. That's how it works and then finding ways to tell those stories that work for the listener, which is the point of this workshop, is a, a, critical, a critical issue. 